First item on the order paper today is members' questions. If members wish to be called uh, to make a statement, they should do so by continually rising in their place. Members who are called will have up to three minutes to make their statement, and members are reminded that statements will not be subject to debate or questioning. Interventions will not be permitted, and I will not take any points on this or any other matter until this item of business has been finished. I call Padraig today. Well, yeah. um, I want to begin today by thanking the Education Minister for his speech yesterday and to take this opportunity to engage with that. I think it was a very positive speech, and the key word which stood out at me was opportunity. Each one of us in this assembly have the opportunity to make a real change for Irish medium education. That means working as an, uh, an education committee, and it also means working with the education minister. I have three Gilskolna in my area who are all fantastic. They each have their unique attributes, their unique ethos, but one of the things that they have in common is that they all punch well above their weight in sport, in music, and in academia. And that's one of the many reasons why so many parents have bought into them because they've seen what they've done for their children, for their community, and for our entire city. But one of the other things that they have in common is the fact that all three Gail Skolna and Derry continue to be, have their children educated in porter cabins. That wasn't acceptable in 1980, it isn't acceptable in 2000, and it certainly is not acceptable in 2024. So there's an ethical reason why we need to do this, but there's also a financial reason. And all of the parties in here came together last week and agreed that financially we have been hamstrung by the Tory government in London and that we need to come together to oppose that. But financially, we also need to make a decision to properly fund education to make sure that our Gale School and many other schools across the North aren't crippled by soaring maintenance costs. You see, it is within our gift to ensure that all our schools reach their full potential. It's within our gift to make that happen. And one of the things which was very clear yesterday is that the Education Minister has a desire to do that, and I welcome that very much. Because what we have to do is work collectively to ensure that every child has not just a fair start in life, but the best start in life. And I want that for children in Gaelskull Aidan Moore, in Gaelskull Nadaraga, and in Bunskull Kilya. I want that for children in every school across the North. Because we can see what they deserve that's what they deserve for our children, for our families, and for our communities. I call Mr. Guy Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words this morning about Heart Health Month and National Heart Month. Uh, February is a month where charities and organisations across Northern Ireland and further afield raise awareness of heart health and the impact that it has on us as individuals and our families. At the start of this month, many buildings across Northern Ireland were lit red uh, to encourage people to get talking about heart health. Heart and circulatory diseases cause nearly a quarter of all deaths in Northern Ireland, or around 4,000 deaths per year. That's an average of 11 per day. Around 1,100 of those are from individuals who are under the age of 75. Whether it's losing a loved one to cardiac arrest, or coping with the devastating impact uh, of heart failure. Far too many of us have felt the pain of heart and circulatory conditions. In 2021, my father-in-law, Cyril Davis, who was seemingly so fit and healthy, uh, sadly died of a massive coronary episode. None of us seen it coming, and indeed it's been a difficult journey for our family getting used to life without him. Sadly, this is a story that is all too familiar to many families across Northern Ireland. On this National Heart Month, this month which as a family would have marked Cyril's 60th birthday, I am asking all of my fellow members and people across Northern Ireland join, to join with me and others in sharing heart health messages uh, on their social media and also to get people talking in terms of their daily conversations. The, char the charity Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke are strongly urging people to consider their cardiovascular health. Its step-by-step -step campaign encourages people to take seven steps towards a healthier, stronger heart. They're encouraging people to sign up for their online health check through their website. 
Increase your steps in physical activity. Try following a healthy and balanced diet. Cut back on alcohol and quit smoking. Look after your mental health and get enough sleep. And get to know the signs of a heart attack. Uh, in Stormont Estate uh, this month, there will be a red dress fun run at 11 o'clock here on the 25th of February. I would encourage as many people to get involved in this event and to encourage your families to do likewise. I pay tribute to all of those charities who are proactively working in the area of heart health. The British Heart Foundation, the Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke, Children's Heartbeat Trust and many, many more. By continuing to support these charities and raising awareness, your message could indeed save a life and hopefully touch the right person. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Ms. Horsey Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would just like to draw the House's attention to a constituent of mine, Dr. Stephen Taylor, who is a Lisburn man born and bred, who has followed on in the footsteps of Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell and has been involved in groundbreaking research in terms of pulsars and, if I get the science part right, the North American nanohertz observation. Dr. Stephen Taylor was educated at Wallace High School in Lisburn and was a first generation university student. For me, that's something that I spoke about yesterday in my maiden speech and I'm extremely passionate about in terms of giving our young people all the chances that they have in life. Here we have a young person who came from humble beginnings, a first generation university student who has gone on not just to break strides and break through that glass ceiling, but is actually delivering on the world stage to new scientific heights. I think it's important that we take the opportunities, much and all as we talk about some of the challenges that face us, which is right, but I think it's important that we also take the opportunity to congratulate and to note those people from our community who are going out and making those strides on the world stage. I would also just like to conclude by saying that there is much more of a role for science to play in terms of our young people and the opportunities that that gives. Indeed, whenever you look at what Dr Stephen Taylor has studied, he has indeed, as I have previously mentioned, followed on in that work from Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, looking at pulsar timing arrays in his PhD and those are the sorts of things that we will need our young people in Northern Ireland to do if we are serious about tackling those issues in terms of research, innovation and making lives better for people. So I simply um, thank you for your indulgence at this time, Mr Speaker, for acknowledging the success. Um, and I want to congratulate Dr Stephen Taylor at this time for his, if I just get this right, in terms of the actual proper name of what has occurred. I would like to put on record my congratulations to him for the University of Cambridge and the Royal Astronomical Society for naming him as their 2024 Eddington Lecturer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Call Mr Tom Elliott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wanted to congratulate a, a local a sports club in Fermanagh and South Tyrone who have just been crowned world champions for the second year in a row and it's in a, in a lesser, maybe known sport in tug of war, and that's the country club who are based in, in Fermanagh and South Tyrone. Uh, they have been in Sweden the last uh, number of days competing in the World Championships. They won uh, two runners up and one third place, but it was in uh, the 560 kilos uh, that they excelled and uh, they are crowned world champions for the second year in a row. So I would like to put on record the congratulations to them and their competitors and it's something that's very close to my heart, Mr Speaker, because I'm a former member of that club and a, and a former tug-of-war uh, champion with them as well. Many years ago, I might add, but on this occasion, congratulations to the current club. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. Mr Speaker, since 1998, 70 people have lost their lives on the A5 road. Now, I know this House has heard about this road on many occasions, but patience has worn thin. This week, we are optimistic that the new Minister, John O'Dowd, will soon make a decision, a positive decision, on the A5 road. Hundreds of families are awaiting positive news, particularly after the very successful public inquiry that was very well attended over a course of two weeks. It was attended by the families who lost loved ones 
uh, over the last 20 odd years. It was also attended by businesses uh, and locals in my constituency and beyond that feel so strongly about the development of this project. We cannot take a single moment for granted because every delay to this road, Mr. Speaker, costs another human life. In recent times, there's been some horrific accidents on that road. I, too, have known uh, personally a number of people that have died in very tragic circumstances. Most recently, Dan McCain, his sister Christine McCain, and their aunt Julia McCain. They were on their way back from a funeral and sadly lost their lives uh, at this Acnacloy stretch of the A5 road. Also, we have Peter McNamee, Nathan Corrigan, and Peter Funnigan that lost their lives in the Ballygolly stretch of the road at Gervahe. There is no section of this road that is safe, and the loss of those lives and the impact on those families is testament to just how dangerous that road is for each and every one of us on a daily occasion. And I haven't even touched on the thousands of injured people, people who've been left with life-changing uh, injuries that are having to survive the trauma of that road, yet face that road every day as they live along it and have to access it. It runs through the very heart of my constituency. There is no avoiding it. We're forced onto this death trap on a daily basis. That is why, and I'm sure I don't have to convince this House, it is so critical that a decision is made soon. And I encourage the Minister for Infrastructure to do that. But equally, I encourage our colleagues in Dublin, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar and the Tanista Mio Martin, to recommit significant funds to ensure the delivery of this road. Their intervention is critical to its delivery. Uh, their support for this project is critical for the delivery of the project. Today, we think of all of those who have lost their lives and we think of their families. Let us hope, Mr. Speaker, that a decision will arrive soon and a positive one at that. Thank you. Call Orla Flynn. Uh, um, and it's my first opportunity to address you as the, the new Speaker of the House, so I wish you all the very best in your new role. Um, but this morning, um, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a very significant report that was published um, last Wednesday by the, safety, uh, the Patient Safety Commissioner in England. So the huge report is recommending that women who have been injured by pelvic mesh implants will receive a payment of £20,000 um, and that this should be followed by further payments for, for some individuals in relation to their specific cases. Um, I do want to commend, I think she might be watching, um, streaming in online this morning, I want to commend Mary McLaughlin, who represents the Mesh Ireland campaign group. Mary actually travelled over to England last week to hear the findings of the report. And again, I mean, she is only one of thousands, many thousands right across the island, who has been left um, terribly injured um, as a result of these Mesh implants. The Mesh Ireland campaign group and also the Sling the Mesh campaign group um, there are two local groups that have been supporting countless women over the past number of years who have been left with injuries, have lost their jobs, lost their homes and in many cases have actually lost their marriages and their relationships as well because of the damage that was inflicted to their bodies as a result of these devices. Um, I do welcome the Department of Health statement that they said that they are now considering this report and its findings um, and would obviously just like to, to put it on the record that the, the issue is given um, very urgent attention because some of these women have been living with these implants in their bodies in, in extremely severe pain for now many, many years. I think the implant started here locally in 1998. Um, so they've already faced delays in terms of their diagnosis. They haven't received timely interventions in terms of removal of these uh, mesh implants, which are extremely difficult to remove. And then they also missed out on an opportunity um, that was availed. The women in Scotland were given a chance to um, go to the USA to have a world-leading mesh removal expert remove their mesh implants, and women here haven't had that option. So again, it's just to put the urgency on it that even if we here locally could consider and the Department of Health could consider these redress payments, um, I do think that it would send a very, very clear signal to our women here that we obviously are conscious of the pain and the hurt that they have went through as a result of a failing of our health system and that we're going to do all we possibly can um, to support them in the time ahead. Thank you very much. Don Harry Harvey. So, Mr Speaker, as I rise here this morning for the first time this new mandate, I do so with a deep sense of pride. 
Mr. Speaker, I congratulate you on your recent appointment to your new role and wish you well in it. A tremendous opportunity and with that also a huge responsibility. However, Mr. Speaker, my reason for rising here this morning lies much deeper than all this. I do so in remembrance of those who have gone before us, and I think back to ironically exactly 50 years ago now. Mr. Speaker, your father, Charles Poots, along with my father, Cecil Harvey, walked these corridors, occupied these rooms, and spoke fiercely in this very chamber. And it's them I wish to mention today in their memory. Both men were elected to the first Northern Ireland Assembly in 1974. I know Edwin and myself have many memories of them in this place and others. And when I'm on my feet, I also wish to welcome all the new members, and I'm glad you now have the opportunity to participate in all the proceedings of this House, and I do wish you all well, as I do all those who have returned to these benches. We are all here to help and improve the lives of others, and that should be our ultimate goal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Declan Kearney. This is the 130th day of Israel's war in Gaza, and 37,000 Palestinians are now dead or lie lifeless under the rubble of Gaza. 1% of all Palestinian children in the Gaza Strip have been killed. And in the space of one month, the equivalent of two Hiroshima bombs have been dropped in the Gaza Strip. Currently, 1.5 million Palestinians who have been forcibly displaced from their homes in Gaza are being pushed into Rafah, a place which is normally home to just 250,000. Mr. Speaker, this is an existential atrocity taking place in real time. And I would appeal to political and community leaders right across our society to support the demand for an end to this war, to support an immediate and permanent ceasefire, to ensure that the medical and humanitarian relief being denied to the Palestinian people is provided, and that Israeli forces are withdrawn immediately from both Gaza and the West Bank. It is time to end this war. It is time to end Israel's illegal occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. It is time finally to enforce international law, not simply to speak about it. And, Mr. Speaker, it is finally time to recognise the State of Palestine. I call Kate Nicholl. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I didn't get the opportunity to congratulate you on your elevation to speaker yesterday. I'd like to do so now. When I was a newly elected MLA with a tiny baby in tour outside of my own colleagues, you were especially kind to me, and I know you'll do very well in the role. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to speak on the, the matter of Palestine and what's happening in Gaza. Uh, as um, a South Belfast MLA, I do a lot of work with refugees and asylum seekers, and I'm currently helping two Palestinians um, whose family members are in Gaza and I watch on how they are in despair seeing what is happening. I think that you can acknowledge and recognize, and it is true that on the 7th of October, the Hamas terrorist attack is something that must be condemned, unspeakable cruelty. You can also say what is happening in Palestine right now is unspeakable cruelty. And as someone whose focus is on children um, and the next generation, the fact that over 12,000 children have died you know what? That is that is that is not a proportionate response. That is devastation. Every one of those children has a name and a family and a life, and they're gone. And I keep thinking about Hind Rajab. You know, six years old, not much older than than my son, and the fear she must have experienced, and the silence the silence around these lives that matter. Every single person matters. Every person is important. Every life matters. And what is happening in Palestine is wrong. And the very least we could say, the very least we should be saying right now is that it is wrong and that the UK and the USA have to be unambiguous around the need for a, for a ceasefire. I'll close by saying 
Um, last year, during the Good Friday Agreement 25th anniversary celebrations, I met with Palestinian and Israeli filmmakers. And they kept asking me really specific questions about how we work together, how we appointed chairs, how our governance worked. This was just something so far-fetched, this idea of, of working together. And I keep thinking about them, these people that I met who had come here with such hope. Before, before October, before all of this spiraled, before their family members died, before they were living in, in complete fear. And I, I, I sent a message to one of the filmmakers and I said, I just want you to know we're rooting for you. What else do you say? And he came back and he said that their imaginations are so filled with fear and hate and death right now that the only thing that was giving them hope was their time in Northern Ireland and their hope was to come back and spend time with the politicians here. And I suppose what all I would say is we can honour that by making our politics work, but we have to be unambiguous in the need to speak out and say what is happening right now is wrong. Thank you. We call Mr. Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, sometimes things are so barbaric, so uh, horrific to watch, you don't even know somehow how to even speak or begin to start to speak about it, but speak out, I think we must. And I'm referring to the fact that what's been happening, particularly in the last few days, uh, in Rafa and Gaza, I think nobody now can deny that what's happening is the attempted annihilation of the people of the Gaza Strip. Uh, Israel is preparing a new genocidal assault on a civilian population of 1.5 million people who are already living under constant bombardment, who are denied food, water and medical aid. They were told to go to Rafa to be safe. They are now being slaughtered and killed. This genocide has reached new depraved depths and it is unacceptable for this place to stay quiet about it. In recent days alone, we have seen ambulances targeted, we have seen health workers slaughtered in daylight. We have seen the summary execution of six-year-old Hind Rajab killed just after her mother and father were slaughtered. She was pleading for help. We have seen a mutilated child hanging from a building in Gaza, sickening, depraved stuff. These are war crimes, Mr Speaker, war crimes paid for and funded by the West. This has never been about Hamas. War leaders are funding, supporting, arming are complicit in what's happening. They should be never forgiven for supporting these crimes against humanity, these crimes against Palestinian people that say their names. Last week, when I first sat, Mr. Speaker, I urged MLAs to collectively call uh, for a ceasefire. I submitted a motion to that effect. I think this Assembly needs to bring that forward as a matter of urgency to discuss this issue, to make it clear that we cannot operate as normal, we cannot continue as normal while a genocide goes on uh, in plain uh, daylight. There should be no diplomatic ties with Israel. They should be boycotted. The Israeli ambassador should be expelled from this island. And also, I make a plea, a sincere plea. People should boycott the White House this St. Patrick's Day. People who have stood on protest with should not give cover to Genocide Joe, a man who's up to his neck in the slaughter of Palestinians, a man who's jointly responsible for 30,000 Palestinians being killed. It's his money. His finance from the, the US that has allowed this slaughter to happen. So, parties should not give cover to Genocide Joe this St. Patrick's Day. Parties should not pose the picture for him, should not give him a bowl of shamrocks while he is up to his neck in this slaughter and stand up for the people of Palestine, free Palestine. Call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to be able to make this statement today. And what I'm going to make it about is about the issue of the education of our children, which we all know is exceptionally important, but it's that issue for parents at times to be able to actually get to the school. Quite often, I'm sure we all have schools in our constituencies where there is serious congestion outside the school gates and it causes significant problems. And within my area, my constituency, there is a problem uh, outside Our Lady and St. Patrick's Primary School on Edward Street. Uh, which causes uh, much annoyance to those parents trying to get to the school, but also to the residents that live in that area. And what we have seen and witnessed uh, along this street is large lorries, large vehicles making their way down that street 
forcing children as young as P1s to have to be pinned up against a wall whilst large vehicles mount a footpath to get past. And this puts the absolute fear into them as they're making their way to school. Now, there is a solution to this, and I met last year with Sustrans uh, and brought them down to witness and see what was taking place. And the solution is a school street uh, scheme. These exist in the south, they exist uh, in England and other places, and effectively what it does is where there is an identified problem, uh, there is a restriction on traffic flow outside uh, that school during the periods of time when children are arriving and departing from school. And that is enough to make that space safe. It reduces the pollution that there is in these confined spaces and that we're forcing our children and young people uh, to, to consume. And it means that they can get in and out of school freely. Uh, we don't currently have that scheme. We were told by the department that we couldn't uh, because there was no minister. Uh, and I'm hopeful now that we do have a minister for infrastructure that we might see at least a pilot project uh, take place to see if we can evaluate the benefits and I would advocate for that happening uh, in Edward Street in Downpatrick. Uh, I have written uh, to the Minister this morning and I hope that that's something that we can see. If it did take place and it was successful, it should be available to other members in other constituencies and then we can allow our children to get to and from school safely. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, this week Within days of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson and some of his nodding acolytes on the DUP benches, telling us that the union had been restored, that Northern Ireland's place within it was secure, and that the REC border had been removed. All within days of that, this week we had the um, Trading Support Service issue new guidance about the movement of goods to and from Northern Ireland. And that new guidance expressly defines goods produced in Northern Ireland as union goods, not UK union goods, European union goods. Expressly declares that. And that, of course, proceeds in that guidance to define Northern Ireland as a EU territory. And that is because, contrary to what Sir Geoffrey has said, Northern Ireland, because we continue to be under the EU Customs Code, is operating on the basis that GB is a third or a foreign country. And the guidance from the Trading Service goes on to say that if you are moving goods from Union territory like Northern Ireland, to further union territory like the EU mainland and you go through GB, then you have to prove by virtue of what's called proof of union status as to the, uh, that your goods actually came from union territory. So transfer goods through GB to the EU mainland Businesses in Northern Ireland are going to have to demonstrate, with all the paperwork and bureaucracy that goes with it, proof of union status. And likewise, goods coming from the EU via GB into Northern Ireland have to do that. And of course, the inevitable consequence of that is that goods will those who are transporting goods will choose to simply transport them more and more via the Republic of Ireland to avoid the proof of union status and to bring them in via the Republic of Ireland. And therefore, we shall have further diversion of trade in consequence of the fact that Northern Ireland outrageously continues to be regarded as union territory. Well done, Geoffrey. Well, that concludes all the, the members who uh, sought to make a statement. We've got 12 in yesterday, we've got 12 in today. Yeah, some of them are very interesting. And I commend members uh, for raising a wide range of, of topics, um, which I think are quite useful. So the first item of business is a motion to suspend Standing Order 21, or 20 bar 1. Mr. Clark, please read the motion. That Standing Order 21 be suspended for Tuesday, 13 February 2024. I called Paula Brown.